Oh, definitely. You're the best. <laughs> so I guess data wins over opinion after all. <laughs> Hello there, my name's Scott Horn, and I lead the Fulfillment by Maersk team in technology at Maersk. Too slow? Yeah, which is good, I'm usually too fast, I like it. Hi, I'm Tammy Snow. I'm Vice President of Research and Data Analytics at Workday. Fun fact about me, when I was 14 years old, I drove an 18-wheel diesel 100 miles across the southern Nevada desert. I had not stolen the diesel. Well, she set the bar very high. <laughs> Our team looks after shipping the goods between warehouses, fulfilling the goods within them of those warehouses, and on occasion delivering the last mile goods to your home or to your couch. So Scott, it's been a couple of years since we've seen each it other. It has. As, as I recall, when we worked together, there were a couple of times when maybe we did not necessarily see eye to eye on something. This is true. I think there were a couple of times I might have uh, let some opinion overrule the uh, facts. To your credit, you were open to data, perhaps changing your mind and, and maybe taking a different approach or rethinking your opinion. Exactly, and I think it's going to be a great opportunity today to use some data through this game to decide who's more right or wrong. Should we give it a go? I think so. Okay. I should warn you, I'm quite competitive. <laughs> Ooh. Oh. So I have a question for you. What is fulfillment technology? Fulfillment technology, I guess, is the technology that backs everything that happens from the moment goods find their way into a dock door of a, a warehouse or a container freight station. Uh, what happens inside that warehouse in terms of moving the goods out the back of a container, uh, potentially into another trailer or another container. And then some of the elements that happen along the journey, getting those goods from one warehouse to another, and ultimately how we get the goods in the hands of the consumer. Sometimes that will be uh, to a shop, sometimes that will be directly to your door, doorstep. And maybe I should quit going for the nose. Oh, you hit it, it just wouldn't, it wouldn't. So I've got a question for you, Tammy. How can businesses put the user at the center of the new tech? So do so everything you can to understand the user, and that includes their technical skills and aptitude and capabilities. The other thing is to understand in the context that they're working in, what are all of the uh, things that they have to work with? So you talked a bit about with the fulfillment center, that there are a lot of goods. There are ways that goods get transported to and from. There's technology that they have to work with. So the extent to which you can understand, first of all, what's the user's goal? Yes. And what is the job that needs to be done in order to help them achieve that goal? That can be very important. Oh! <laughs> I, may, I may have just lost. It's <laughs> coming straight over the top. And now I'm getting challenged to even keep it on there. Oh! One of the tools that I've used to help describe that is a journey map. So you may recall from our days of working in travel that we had developed a, a journey map to describe. It yeah, yeah, it, des it described all of the behaviors that an individual engages in as they go from thinking about something to actually achieving that something. And talking about the systems and the processes that they interacted with. So Scott, a question for you. What are the UX implications of having a single experience for the world? I think, um cultures around the world, you know, life experiences, educational experiences, you know, age experiences, um, have a lot to do with uh, what helps us understand how to interact with the technology around us. And warehouse operators in each country, or even each state, may have subtle differences in how they execute. In making a user experience that serves both, it's an ongoing challenge and something that, while really important in terms of ensuring we can get the best uh, techniques and tools injected into that one experience still needs to be flexible, configurable enough so different people can use it. Usability, the things that make something usable, tend to translate globally across the board. Where things become nuanced and differences, it's in the language that is used, the colors that are used, and the fact that color has different meanings for different people. In some countries, people are much more uh, attuned to 
visuals and photography. It's interesting when we do have such uh, fluctuating needs and volumes. You know, the fact that we might be able to take someone who normally drives a forklift and may now be able to operate um, some allocations in terms of inventory, may be able to do some picking and packing. Because we've made that UX more accessible, I think it might be your turn now. It's my turn. <laughs> let's, see, let's see how I can do. Time to get on the board. Oh, I was so close to the that nose. nose. Is still there. Let's see, I'm going to have to have a go for that one this time too. But let's see if I, I know I shot, shot almost over the top last time. Let's see. Oh. Ooh. How can companies ensure their UX is accessible and inclusive? Think about the fact that with the internet being around a long time, there are general user experience principles and patterns that apply across the board. So the extent to which you leverage those well-understood, well-researched patterns, uh, the better able you are to ensure that you have accessible and inclusive products. So I think starting from that, focus that on the, the, what's most generalized, the trends that you see with most people. And then you consider, if you're going to optimize, optimize for the audience that either has the greatest deal, gr greatest deal of complexity to, to focus on yeah. or with the highest degree of constraint. Um, we've had a couple of examples in one of our fulfillment uh, warehouses where it's like very, very small goods that require quite detailed uh, elements of what they need to do to pack, yeah. to fit and quite complex, um, obviously, arrangements to make sure you put the right things in each box. And I, I can, I've seen in, interesting examples of how we've catered for folks that have uh, less great eyesight that's great hearing, and um, and it's just the delight you can bring to a, to a person's experience. Obviously, that encourages them to think beyond what they might have otherwise been able to do to maybe you know enjoy their job a lot more, but obviously do a better job in the process. I would be willing to bet that by focusing on that audience, you've actually simplified the experience and made it better for everybody. That's such a good point. Uh, yeah. I think you're first this time. Though, I think so, so maybe. Yeah. But I'm getting nervous because I feel like that nose is not going to go my way. Ooh. <laughs> All right. Come on, nose. Oh, you know what? I, I just don't think it wants to go off from this side. I think there's, I some, just... there's some advantage on this side. Oh. That's two from two. <laughs> it's funny, you can hit the same spot over and over again. It's just not the you right know, spot. We're going to probably find out. Oh. oh, finally got one. Yes. <laughs> we brought on a team uh, that has some software that you know, literally runs the same user interface, what we call the one Maersk user interface, um, across the, all of their warehouses. Uh, of course, there's still the other parts that don't. Now, both you and I have shared a little bit of experience in, in obviously seeing great new UIs, user experiences come, come from acquisitions, but then knowing that sometimes it, we have to sacrifice what might be good for one for what will be better for the for the whole. If you have a global platform that people become more mobile. I think that there's there's similar concept here when you talk about having going from multiple user interfaces or experiences to a single one, you create a, a level of cohesion. That reduces the again, we'll get back to that reduces the cognitive load. It reduces the visual load. So when we look at things that don't necessarily look like they fit together, that actually takes energy from our brains and it takes away from our ability to focus on the things we need to focus on. Oh, I hit it. Oh, I got a dick. I think they're getting glued on this time. It's a machine gun fire. All right, I have another question. Uh, how do you account for constant change? It's going to count for itself. Mm -hmm. I guess it's what we do about it um, that lets us account for how we make it better. So changes is, is going to happen. We're going to have new regulations. We're going to have different constraints. The weather's going to change. Um, you know, things are going to be imposed on us that we didn't anticipate. I think you said it nicely in, in talking about a, in a one experience, you would change the code in one place. If you've got it in 25 experiences, um, you know, not only do you have to change it in all those places, you have to go and then check what the implications are. And so, yeah, that ability to, to roll it out with one code base, with one user experience, but also then apply necessary configurations if there are um, things that only apply in unique places as opposed 
as opposed to everywhere. It's very difficult to operate at scale, obviously yes. without some kind of standards. Uh, yeah, the reality is we've talked about the single code base, mm -hmm. the process for being able to release, obviously into different countries. Um, having some of the, uh, I guess, the process process maps, we might call them, or journeys. Journeys, yeah. As we're, we're more familiar yeah. with, yeah. Taking the time to learn about what the journey is, to me, is so intertwined with what a standard is anyway, because what are you trying to do? You're trying to understand the job you have to do, and then mm -hmm. you're trying to optimize an experience around it. One of the things, you know, when you talk about scale and you talk about platform and patterns is really uh, pushing our teams to think in terms of, number one, what are the patterns that exist in the world? And what are the psychological and human computer interaction principles that can be applied to what we do? Because that's one way to scale. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of stuff out there. The second layer of that is having a design, a design library or a design system. That's super powerful because that, that becomes a way that you can build the experiences that can be leveraged across the entire platform. In terms of nurse end-to-end -end integrator strategy, um, it becomes equally important as we make our fulfillment technology feel comfortable for folks working in warehouses, managing uh, truck brokerage, uh, managed transport, dealing with the last mile optimization. We also have folks dealing with customs. We have folks mm. dealing with the maritime side. We have folks doing supply chain management. And if we're able to bring those metaphors, those patterns across that, you can imagine that someone who maybe had a great uh, operator experience doing customs and we have a need all of a sudden to do a lot more warehousing, that person could shift their, their abilities, they could yes. expand for a little bit of time to help out there. So one more for you, Tammy. All right. Making the job more enjoyable for our employees and making them also more performant. I think it's really important for us as technologists to keep in mind that people come to work with an expectation of the way the digital tools will work. And when those digital tools don't work in a way that they expect them to, or in a way that allows them to do their jobs effectively, we're creating friction. And when you create friction in people's lives, work becomes less enjoyable. But I think, um, I think it is a different time and the expectations have changed. If you can't have what you'd, what you'd come to expect from a consumer experience, you can't have something as easy as your Apple TV or your Netflix or okay. some other product that's become very dominant in your day, day time. We come to work, we spend more time at it probably than in yes. anywhere else. The last one. No, I don't know. The, the, Only because the I got the nose. <laughs> the decider. Got that nose oh, again. <laughs> so I guess data wins over opinion after all. <laughs>